Hi, I'm Dean Furman, and this is my trip down Sheepfoot Lane. Hi, Dean. I bet you never thought that when you came back from South Africa a few weeks ago, it is only a few weeks ago, isn't it? It is. That you would uh, be zooming in to Boundary Park when you returned. Hi, Roy. It's, it's so nice to see you. And um, it was so nice to get a phone call from you the other day. And we, and we chat, chat some memories. And obviously, we're going to speak some more memories. But um, just to speak of the good times we had down, down at Oldham, it's, 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 it's a, it was a fantastic few years of my career. And it's just, it's nice to bring up those, those, those good times, those old memories and discuss different players and different great results. So it's fantastic to get that phone call from you the other day. Um, and it's really good to see you. You're still going strong. I tell you what, we had hoped to have Wes on with you. Uh, I spoke to him at lunchtime today and he liked the idea of coming on, uh, but we kept losing one another. And when he said the magic words, I've got a dodgy internet here, I give up. I thought, no, 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 because we, we had uh, Paul Dick off the other week and we actually did him about 1.30 when that tremendous storm was going on. And it uh, was all right here, but down in Cheshire, it kept freezing. And now our uh, producer, our editor, got something out of it. You can't even tell, you know. Right. But all at once, it just freeze and you think, are you all right, Paul? You know, we've got plenty of outtakes from it, which we're going to do a programme of those. So, was you here then, two weeks ago? I was. I was actually, I, I've just become a father. And um, we were in the hospital, so we kind of we were we were internal in the hospital, so we didn't have a window, so we we didn't really see the brunt of it. We heard it. Um, I bet you did. <laughs> we did. We did. Um, but yeah, came back and and uh, we were told all about it. It was a, a pretty wild one, from what I believe. Dean, how did you arrive at Boundary Park? Where did you come from? So um, the, the the quick story was um, I was I was born in um, I was born in South Africa. Moved over to the UK when I was five. Uh, started at Chelsea Academy when I was nine. I was there until um, eighteen. Really went to the youth team. Um, from the youth team, I went to uh, up to Glasgow Rangers. I was pretty much released from Chelsea youth team. Went up to Glasgow Rangers. Played a few years there. Made my debut there. Um, and then at Rangers, we signed, I mean, they, they had incredible players. They had Barry Ferguson, Charlie Adam, uh, they signed Pedro Mendes and, and Steve Davis. There was just no way I was going to, I was going to get a, a chance. So, uh, Stuart McCall took me on loan to Bradford. I had a fantastic season on loan at Bradford. It was my first real season in the first team. Um, and I would have, I would have definitely gone and signed there. And I, I did say to to Stuart at the time I said look if, if a team from League One comes in I, I would like to I would like to um, give myself that challenge to play as, as high as possible I think I was 21 and um, I think that season I'd played particularly well against Darlington um, and Dave Penny was the manager at Darlington so in, in League Two I'd played pretty well against Darlow for Bradford and when Dave Penny got the job at Oldham, I think I was I was uh, first on his on his wish list. So Oldham came knocking. It was a chance opportunity to play in League One, and um, I didn't have to think twice about it. All right, right. Oh well, I'm very pleased. As far as I'm concerned, it's the only thing that Dave Penny did right for me. Uh, <laughs> and I hope my editor puts that out as well. <laughs> I'd rather you say it than me. <laughs> yeah, but well, well, there you go. I mean, he, uh, he he never became a fan's favourite at Oldham, and, and yeah. was gone pretty quickly. You know. It was it was a difficult season, and I think um, we we didn't do particularly well on the pitch. I don't think his relationship with the fans was was that great from the beginning. Um, and then when the team's not doing well, it doesn't take a lot for the fans to turn even even more against the coach. No, um, he gave me a few problems, I'll tell you. Really? Yeah, he did. Yeah, I just unfortunately sometimes these things just don't work out. But I was, I was always grateful that he gave me opportunity to come to come to Boundary Park. So um, plenty of people don't have much to thank him for, but I, I certainly do uh, thank him for bringing me there. Right, you know the, the cup run. Did you play? You just told me earlier when I was just checking it out with you. You didn't play in the Liverpool game, but did you play in the rounds going up to Liverpool? 
So I played in I played in the rounds going up to Liverpool. I think we played Burton in the first round, if I remember, at home. Um, we then played Donny in the second round, um, and then I believe in the third round we had um, Nottingham Forest away, which is still to this day one of my favourite games that I played. Yeah, in. Well, that that was a game where all the backroom staff, apart from Dick off and the physio, had gone. Exactly. And we exactly. talked about that the other day, so we won't bore the listeners with that. Yeah. But, uh, well, well, from one thing I, I, I would say, and I've already said it, that backroom staff all came to Forest to watch the game, didn't they? Yeah, yeah. It, show, it shows. It was. It was a. It, unfortunately, that that's what happens when results results turn against you. Funny things happen, but it, it was a. It was but a good the, backroom staff. But, but the cup run showed that we had a decent side, and he was getting it together. We really did, and, and and the season before, I mean, we started like a house on fire. I think up until February, we were in the playoffs. Mm. Um, I remember, I remember the way we started the season. We were, it was, it was, um, it was the gaffer's first first job, and we were playing yeah. in his mould. We were playing like him. We were hungry. We were fierce. We were on the front foot. We were pressing. Yeah. Uh, everything wasn't you <laughs> yeah it, it was great no nobody wanted to play us we were just so difficult to play and um i, I always felt kind of we, we lost our identity a little bit the more players we brought in especially the loans when we brought in the loan players we kind of lost our way a little bit and we weren't as we we, we had lost our, our early season kind of um momentum I, exactly and and our we we lost our um identity a little bit and we, we kind of we had we had a bit of a, a split where some boys were doing what we were doing early in the season and some weren't and if you're going to play that kind of style everyone has to do it you either all do it or you don't do it and I, I felt that we were somewhere in the middle so that that season kind of we were from being up in the playoffs we fell away and and um the following season was was more of a was more of a struggle so by the time that forest game came around i, I do remember that all the staff were were kind of let go uh, but they all came to the game, and, and I'm sure you've heard it from the gaffer's point of view. Point of view, but from a player's point of view, I'll always remember. I mean, fantastic ground. Uh, no one expects anything from us. The, the the FA Cup, you get all the all the Oldham fans behind the goal, so you got a you've got six thousand there. Um, and then you, I always remember the first half. We didn't touch the ball. We didn't get anywhere near it. I mean, I, I think Andy Reid was was running, <laughs> running us all over the park. We just couldn't get near the ball. And I always remember coming in at half time and and um, the gaffer saying, "Lads, look, you can either just go out and whatever, and no one's going to make no take any notice of it, or have a go, have a go second half, see what happens." And that second half, 45 minutes, was, was up there with the best 45 minutes that we played. We were, we were unstoppable. Um, we played so, so well. Yeah. And then there was the Baxter free kick. Wasn't Joe, there? they scored a free kick, I, I think, just after their red card. They had a, a, That's right. Well, it was from that. From, from the red card. Yeah, yeah. We talked about that, and that, that was the birth of all their Baxter baby song, wasn't it? Yeah, I, Joe, I mean, Joe was such a good player for us. Um, oh, plus eight. He just he just had that ability to see. Not uh, a lot of players see things. It's the ability to see it and to to um, be able to. Um, he, can, he can put the ball into space. Ex exactly. Ex he's, exactly. He's space can't he? But but he needs somebody who understands space as well. Yeah. So so he he was particularly good with with um, Simo and Matt Derbyshire. Um, they they were they were particular because he needed someone on the end of his through balls. He he had as I said he had the ability to see things, but he also had the the, the ability to implement them, um, to carry them out. And and he, he was a special player. He just suited us. I mean, we kind of had me and Wezo behind him doing the dog work and doing the ugly stuff. And we knew that if we got the ball into Jose, something was going to happen. Um, I think he enjoyed it at us. There was a lot expected of Jose. Um, maybe it didn't quite happen for a number of reasons, but at us, I think yeah. he felt set to He would have had a stellar career, wouldn't he, if certain things had gone better for him? Yeah, ability wise, absolutely un unquestionable. I mean, incredible that often you, you don't maybe see in a game because in a game you're, you're uh, you kind of play within yourself a little bit, but you always see it in training and some of the things that he could do with the ball. I mean, he, he was a super player. Uh, but going back to that Forest game, I mean, 
sometimes it's it's more special if you score goals at, at the end that your fans are at. And it's the whole second half, the three goals we scored were all down that end with the, with the away fans. Um, yeah. So with Jose's free kick, I think to um, I think Big Big Smudge scored and Simo scored all down that end. All three goals were celebrated down there with our fans. It, it was a, it was a special moment. So. Um, it was from from Forest. Um, we finished the game. Uh, I got picked up in a car. I went straight down to Heathrow Airport, and I went off to the African Cup of Nations, um, which is why I missed the Liverpool game because I was there playing uh, playing for South Africa um, whilst the Liverpool game was on. So I missed the Liverpool game, but uh, I've watched it many times. I've watched the goals. I've, I've spoken to the guys about it, and, and yeah, what a night for the for the club. Yes, it was, but. Uh... When it comes back to the league games and you went off to the uh, Africa Cup or whichever tournament that you was in, I always thought that we lost something because you didn't just miss one game or two. You had recovery time when you got back and you was probably missing. Yeah. Where you were playing more games for South Africa than you was at them, and, and I could understand that because of what it is, you know. My personal view of all these countries that are far away, they should play the same seasons as Europe. They should. And and in fact the yeah. the, the last the last African nations that we went to, um, which was basically this time last year, um, it was it was in June, so it was in the off season. Yeah. Um and it, it's it really suited the Europeans. I mean you you look at Liverpool and you got you you got your Mane, you got Salah, you got for um, you got Keita. Um, yeah. Now, if that's in January, those are three huge players you're going to miss. Um, yeah, it's all right for the Premiership clubs, but if we've got two or three, exactly, like they have had now, you know, exactly. where they've been disappearing, and you've three players out of your side. Exactly, it makes it it makes it very difficult. So it was great that it was in June last year, and the one coming up, um, the one coming up now was meant to be in june so so that was the whole plan that they're now going to have it in june during the european off season um the next one coming up has been moved from june to january um have you retired now from international football i i haven't retired um yet i'm i'm still i'm still the vice captain i still play an important role for the national team um would you have a captain i have been the captain yes, yes. i have been the captain um and whew, quite a sad story but i i i became the yeah, captain I, down here. <laughs> I, I became the captain after um our goalkeeper our goalkeeper was a, a guy called Senzo Miyiwa and he was he was the goalkeeper and i remember we i'd just been there to play a game and he was in brilliant form and and he he was the captain and about a week after we had played a game he got shot and killed mm. um which I mean, to this day, they still not found who did it or why or what happened. Um, and it was on the back of, of of his passing that I was given the captain's armband. So I, really, I, I was given the armband in the worst possible circumstances. Um, mm. But at the same time, it, it was, I mean, an incredible honour to captain my country. I captained them um, qualifying for, for another African Cup of Nations and in the African Cup of Nations. So uh, it, it was absolutely amazing honour, especially because... I hadn't really grown up in the country, and and um, I'd I'd grown up in England, so to be taken in by the fans and and the supporters and the national team players was was really really amazing for me because as a so-called outsider, now all of a sudden I'm the captain. It was quite a turnaround in the space of two or three years. Yeah, yeah, because when in, in that World Cup. They took, they took things by storm because they used to dance onto the field, didn't they? They had a bit of a ritual. If I remember rightly, you had to learn the steps, didn't you? Well, five years later, after playing the five years, I can tell you I still haven't learned the steps. <laughs> <laughs> and I never will learn the steps. No, it's something very special about African football. There, there's yes. about, I mean, about South Africa in general, there's a lot of singing and dancing. That's, that's part of the culture. And that, that's one of the special things about... Yeah, it's a bit like Brazil, isn't it? They're, they're, they're at it with the tambourines and... Exactly. And, you know. Exactly. Sometimes you don't even need a warm-up. You're dancing so much in the dressing room, you're dripping with sweat. <laughs> warm-up, let's just stay in here. Um, but, it's, but, I mean, that, that's something special. And that's, that's something that I would say to, to so many players. I'd say, go experience a different culture. Go, go, 
go do something different, go play in a different country, see what it's like, learn from a different way of playing football, um, experience a different dressing room, um, get to meet new people. And, and that's, that's what I took from my experience, just a, a meeting to, and immersing myself in different cultures. Um, I mean, that's so different. It's going to be weird playing in a, in a British dressing room again, where there's no, everyone's got the headphones in, there's no singing, there's no dancing, where it's in, in the South African dressing room, you get in there and you're singing and dancing the whole time. And uh, it's, it really is a great vibe. But you went straight to South Africa from your little spell at Doncaster, you got Dickie to you too. Doncaster, didn't you? Yeah, so so I kind of went before, and, and um, yeah, this is this is a good one with with the Oldham fans. Is when I came back from um, I came back from the Afcon, um, and after um, after we'd not knocked out Liverpool and the Everton draw, so I played in those kind of games. And around that time, so I think it was I think it was February, around those times, that's when uh, Doncaster actually came to take me on loan. Um, and it was a very difficult one for me. Doncaster were top of the league. Oldham, we were down. We were down the bottom, as you know. And it didn't sit well with me to leave. I was a captain, and to leave the club at that time to go to Donny, who were top of the league. So Donny wanted. I think maybe they had a couple of injuries in midfield, um, and they wanted me to help them go and go and get promoted. And it didn't really sit well with me. I thought, how can I leave Oldham, the team I've been at for three years, to go to Donny? Um, it just don't. No, not not now. And and what what really happened? It, it was a deal that suited all parties. I think um, the club. Bickoff not arrived at Doncaster. Then. No, he wasn't there. He wasn't there. So he had left well, Oldham. He actually, use the words. That's why I took him to Doncaster. Well, he may have been instrumental. He may he yeah, may have well, known. Did he probably know he were going? He po- he probably knew he was going. Yeah. So I'm sure he was instrumental. But he wasn't. He only came the following season once we got promoted. Um, so he he wasn't there for that League One. Uh, you know, remember the game at Brentford where they hit the crossbar and, and mm-hmm. ran down the other end. So he he wasn't quite there yet. Um, so it, it actually suited all parties. It meant um, Oldham could get me off the wage bill. They were going to get a bit of money for me from Doncaster. Um, you brought in a, a lone midfielder from Bristol City. I forget his name, but a top top player. Um, so it suited all parties, and, and that made that made the decision easier for me. If uh, like it I sat very uncomfortably with me, and I got an awful lot of stick from the Oldham fans, and to this day, I'm sure, if, I'm sure if I ever come back, I'll be reminded of it. It wasn't something that I was particularly proud of, but what happens behind the scenes is is that it, it did suit a lot of parties. It wasn't just me pushing for it. In fact, I was probably the, the least keen to go, but it was a decision that I took in the end, and and. In the end, Doncaster got promoted, which was fantastic, and, and Oldham stayed up, so everyone ended with a big smile. Yeah, and then, uh, when, so we, we actually got there, didn't we? Uh, I saw you play at Doncaster. I came over because I, I remember Paul Dickoff running up those steps towards the best thing to do his thing, and he hadn't seen me. Right. And I got behind him and sledged him a little bit and called him a nasty little yeah. Scotsman and what have you. And he swung around and clipped me up, you know, got, got on very, very well with him. Yeah. And I know he was warming down that day. I can remember that, you know, because I was there with Big Gordon as, as per usual. Yeah. You know, to, yeah. Together again, we was. And he uh, was a couple, couple, you know. <laughs> you know, Gordy, honestly, the, the legends you both are. It's uh, well, there you go. Uh, so whilst you was over there in South Africa, it's one last question on there would there not be as much traveling as just flying out to South Africa from what from say Europe from all of them in terms of the, in terms of the national team? Yeah, well, I mean, Africa's the nation's got quite expansive, is yeah. Uh, Africa Africa's a massive continent first of all um, and secondly it's not like just hopping a plane to Spain <laughs> a lot of these countries are very are very very difficult to get to so for instance we've played in places like um, on the west coast of Africa um, places like uh, Guinea mm-hmm. and to get there you have to fly to Dubai which is out of Africa and then come all the way across uh, mm-hmm. Africa. So, so sometimes the the transport link. The, I mean the 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 routes. They're not direct. 
you've got to take i mean to get sometimes to get up north it's a nightmare there's no direct flights you've got to go via europe to come back into africa so traveling through africa is very very tough and some of the places we go to i mean it's been the most incredible experience playing for the national team i've probably ticked off half of africa along my travels um but you really see what africa uh, africa's uh, it's, it's a tough continent and to go play football on the continent i mean you, you there are some um incredible obstacles you have to you have to um you have to overcome i played in um places like uh democratic republic of congo um which is one of the best places i've played in terms of atmosphere and in terms of getting off the flight and the team in fact i actually went there because i was playing in the equivalent of the europa league with my team over there we got we got to the final um, and we played a team there in the final called TP Mazembe. And from the moment you step foot off the play and the streets are just lined with people. And this is the Thursday and, and the game's only on the Saturday. And the, the streets are just lined with people kind of giving you the slit throat and giving you the, the like, the, <laughs> you're hiding. And it's three or four days before the game and, and their football club is, is, and their national team is what they, what they live for, the people. It gives them so much hope and pride and passion and glory. Um, and yeah, some of my experiences in Africa have been absolutely incredible, but it, it is a, it's a tough continent to go and play and, and any away point or victory in Africa is, is a huge success. What team did you play to play for over there? So we we called uh, Supersport United, which is the equivalent of Supersport is like Sky Sports. Yeah. Um, so it would be the equivalent of Sky Sports buying a football club and calling them Sky Sports United, if that makes sense. Yeah. So it's it's, it's a sports channel um, which broadcasts to all of Africa, basically. So um, what's the standard of that? The standard the standard is very very good. Um, for me, that I would say that the the English leagues are far more physical, probably a bit more tactical. Over there, it's far more about individual. I mean, some of the natural ability of the players there is just incredible. What the boys can do with that with the ball, uh, I'm in awe. It's it's, it's amazing what they can, what what they can do. Um, it's very very fast. You've got, I mean, you think it's a hot day here. Try playing in 35 degrees, three o'clock kickoff. It's, you, you got the heat. <laughs> um, it's a summer league there. So we, we actually play the same um, schedule as over here. Um, but obviously the seasons are, are the other way around. So that means it's a summer league here. So it is incredibly hot. So you've got the heat to deal with. Um, and... It's a good league. It's, it's, it's a great package. Um, you, we play in the World Cup stadiums, which is fantastic. So you're playing in beautiful stadiums every week. Um, and I've thoroughly enjoyed it. And, and uh, I think one of the things that I'll always look back on is, is I won a number. I think we, we won four trophies, four domestic trophies. We got to the, it's called the Confederations Cup Final, which is the equivalent of the Europa Cup. Um, so we played teams from Guinea to, to Congo to Tunisia. Um, we played all over the continent to get to the final of that, um, and we well, got the travelling. Then, <laughs> yeah, that, I mean, the travelling was it's tough. You need big squads because that is that is really really tough um, because so you. That's you, why you had a, a very tough recovery time every time you went, isn't it? That's the problem. That's the problem. The, the, the good thing is, is that there's no jet lag. It's only one hour difference. At the moment, when the clocks go back, it's two hours. But um, well, it's the distance. It takes it out of you. So if you can imagine, we would, play, we would play on a Saturday and then we'd play probably on a Tuesday. So then the next flight only is Wednesday night. So I'd only get back to Heathrow Thursday morning, which means I'm only getting back up to Oldham Thursday afternoon. I've probably missed training. I only get to training on Friday. Now imagine that that the gaffer's worked on the team for the whole week. All of a sudden I'm back on Friday. How can he just throw me in when he's been working on shape or or tactics or whatever? So that's always the difficulty. It's it's just a long, long way away. It's it's an eleven hour flight. Um and it was always difficult. And the problem I found is that if the team then went and won on Saturday, then it's not fair to to throw me in the next week. If the team's won then the gaffer's got every right to keep the same team. Um, so it always made it difficult and that's we, we hear club v country battles at the very top level even even kind of England players and their, their, their team is here and the national team's here so this is now a, a, a national team over in 
the other side of the world, which makes it even harder. Mm. Ah, well, now, just a little surprise for you. I got a, an email the other day. You're probably not aware, but uh, I've written a book on all the martial arts. It sold, more or less sold out, 350 right. copies. And I got a phone call from an Oldham fan. Well, I didn't realise it was an Oldham fan at the time, but I, I, I even worked out where he lived when he was telling me certain things today. And he's called David Nuttall, and, you know, he's in, probably an accountant or something like that. And he's uh, coming to pick a book up tonight. You know, where uh, I'll throw it on the lawn and he'll throw the tenor and, on the other lawn and then we're all all right. But <laughs> he, uh, he, he was telling me that he goes to all these competitions all over the world. You know, he, he, and he went watching you play over there. And uh, on the day of the Liverpool game, that's why I knew you hadn't played against Liverpool. Yeah. He was back on the Monday. But what he had picked up was a, an apps, a African newspaper or whatever it was, where the nickname he knew, uh, Foreman Furman. Yeah. <laughs> he was a leader on the pitch. And he's got a copy of that. And I, I will promise you, I'll try to get him to photocopy it. We can show it along with this sometimes and because uh, it might i don't know whether we're doing it this weekend or in a couple of weekends now because it's got fragmented because we had to do people separately yeah you know, and change things around a little bit but we'll do that but i will get you a copy of that so uh, and, and i think really it's very very interesting what you said about africa and places like that and it'll be something different than uh, talking about Barrow and Stevenage and yeah. no disrespect to Barrow, although I don't, we're going to be having to go to Barrow next No, I've just seen they've been promoted. I have uh, seen that. You go to the M6 and it yes. says Barrow, and it's 35 miles down the country lane. You know, uh, unless we get uh, a boat from, from Moycombe and sail around, yeah. like, you know, dear me. Uh, Dean, absolutely, thank you very much. It's been absolutely brilliant. My you might pleasure. Have an episode on your own yet? Pardon me. We might even get an episode on your own, and unless that West can get up a ladder and sit on top of his house. We need to get him sorted, honestly, because oh, I love playing with Wes. I just, you just knew that you had a warrior alongside you. I mean, I always remember he used to tackle on the floor with his head like that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> You just knew that you had a warrior alongside you and never yeah, yeah. say die. Um, I really enjoy playing with Wes and, and all those boys. It's, it's quite nice because we, uh, especially uh, me, Simo and, and Big Smudge, we're still very close. We're in contact all the time. We discuss our older memories all the time. So um, yeah, there, there is, there is uh, some good memories from our time uh, at Boundary Park.